judge seven months ago at the start of your tenure as the Good Heart Visiting Professor, I asked you what you hoped to achieve in Cambridge. And you said, and I quote, the principal thing is to reconnect with an intellectual life that I'd put aside when I became a judge. And I wonder whether in retrospect you feel you've achieved this. I have, but not in ways that I had anticipated. That doesn't surprise me. I don't think anywhere I've ever ended up in my life was the place I thought I'd end up in. And that's definitely been true here. Uh, it had been my intention um, to pursue a course of study um, which in the event uh, I did not do because I got deflected in another direction. Um, I thought I would spend a, a deal of time uh, looking at statute law in particular. It's fair to say this is not an environment in which um, that would have been easily undertaken. But the more I prepared lectures here and the more I read of what was going on in the areas of law in which I was teaching, uh, I became vitally aware of the great divergences between the law in my own country and this country. And given that 40 years ago when I was a student here one could write about Anglo-Australian law but one could not sensibly do that today. I um, wanted to uh, inquire into the reasons for the differences and I found that um, has been very interesting, very revealing and it's something about which I will write uh, when I get the opportunity when I go home. That's only half an answer to your question. I did have a deal to do with a number of your scholars here. Um, they ranged from people like uh, Professor Kevin Gray, who's been a very old friend of mine and whom I have always thought to be one of the jewels in Cambridge's crown and I've had a wonderful time discussing property law with him and just the concept of property. There were people I'd never met before, like Lionel Bentley, who's been a, a terrific discovery and a great intellectual companion while I've been here. I won't go on naming people, it's invidious to do so, but I have enjoyed the intellectual engagements that I've had. You said that you plan to teach commercial equity, intellectual property and restitution in the LLM course. Did you enjoy the experience and did you find that your ideas were well received by the students? Did I enjoy the experience? I hadn't taught for 20 years, or syst taught systematically obviously, I'd given the occasional lectures and many of them, but to have to prepare a a course, uh, or a large part of a course, um, I found challenging in that it meant there was a lot of catching up to do. Um, and to deliver them was a completely challenging experience. As time went on, you almost felt as though that the rust was falling off you. It, um, and by the end of it, I thoroughly enjoyed process because talking to a group of postgraduate students, many of whom are interested in what you've got to say, some of them perhaps their, wine, their minds stray a little bit from <laughs> the matter at hand, but um, it's a form of communication quite remote from the courtroom and taking yourself back into the classroom uh, has its challenges, I think. You also mentioned in your first interview that you were going to give a seminar to the Anthropological Research Association on the subject of the Haddon expeditions to the Torres Strait area. 
at the last the turn of the last century. How did this go, Judge? And did you learn anything extra about Haddon and his work from your interaction with anthropologists here? I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. I did it with uh, an archaeologist who happened to have been a non-contentious witness in the case I did. So we had a mix of anthropology and archaeology to start with. From my side of the encounter, it was an explanation to them of what is expected of anthropologists in, well, in this case, in litigation. Uh, it is not just freewheeling thought in the way that the pursuit of their own academic discipline may permit. But the thing I found particularly interesting was bringing home to them that in the practical world that I deal in where anthropology uh, mattered, it mattered along with other disciplines that one could not decide a native title case where one was concerned with the history, customs and mores of a people uh, without the assistance of historians, anthropologists, archaeologists and linguists and that it had to be a cooperative enterprise involving all of them if a sensible decision was to be arrived at. And what emerged in discussion is that there would seem to be a real gulf today between archaeology and anthropology. And I think there was some recognition that that might have been to the detriment of both of them. Um, as to learning more about Haddon, um, I don't think I did because what I, the, where I most learned more about Haddon was I th think I may have mentioned a movie had come out about the Haddon expedition uh, prepared by a, a man Michael Eaton who was a graduate in anthropology here and Haddon had taken a camera uh, a moving camera um, with on his expedition. It only arrived two weeks before the expedition finished. But they had four minutes of uh, dancing uh, filmed on the Murray Island or the island of Murr, and the dancing was of members of a cult, uh, the Marlow cult, or. Uh, on that island and that brought out quite a lot that I was unaware of before. Equally I think after the interview I discovered that the uh, Haddon reports had been republished by Cambridge University Press and they're still in the process of coming out so I've been dipping into them as well so that that's been more my source of int uh, learning but my interest, I think, in Torres Strait and its people continues to grow. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned in, you, in this interview and in your previous interview that you wish to work on statutes and the common mm. law. And in your first interview, you reiterated the view that, I quote, Australia was born for statutes. Uh, you, you, you said you didn't really make much good progress in this yeah, area. No. Um, I mean, would you, were you able to lay your hands on the materials that you required? Well, that was one of the principal reasons I didn't. It would have required the acquisition of a significant amount of material which I had in Australia and which clearly can be found um, in the United States jurisdictions. But... While I would not for a moment say that the significance of statutes is undervalued in this country, and indeed there is a statute law society, um, the forms and level of legal scholarship about statutes seems to me not to have um, taken off to anything like the same extent in this country that has um, in Australia or the United States and it was 
I'm perfectly aware of the um, difficulties under which the library here uh, labours and it seems to me it would have uh, been um, untoward for me to have asked that the library acquire books that would not uh, be used, I think, systematically in the foreseeable future. Judge, can you share any highlights of your time here? That's very hard to... Um, actually uh, give a simple answer to. Uh, it's been a, a thoroughly rewarding and enjoyable experience. Um, and the idea of... Uh, let me start again on that. Um, the highlight to me would simply, to, if I could sound as though I'm opting out of the question, was to have the opportunity to be here. Yes. I've enjoyed an awful lot of it. Um, I think that's where I'd leave the question, actually. I uh, understand. It's the Cambridge experience. Yeah, I've just enjoyed... Yes. Well, not only that, but... It, it's a rare luxury to... Um, be able to walk out of your courtroom and have a year to think. And Cambridge gave me that opportunity, so it, mm -hmm. I hope I've used it some used it profitably. Um, coming to the two papers published during your time here, the Federal Law Review paper and your chapter in Exploring Private Law, did you work on these while you were in Cambridge? No, I, I didn't. Both of them were substantially written before here. The one in the Federal Law Review, I gave a, a revised version um, to the Public Law Discussion Group here, and I adapted that. Um, but they, in a, in a sense, both of them represent an ongoing interest. The um, the one on contract law, I in fact gave a more sophisticated version of that paper to the um, Max Planck Institute in Hamburg and another variant on it uh, to the uh, European and Comparative Law Group in Oxford. Right. So that they represent interests both publications represent interests that have had a past and will have a future. So I, I have been doing continuing work on them rather than them just being set pieces which I'll put, put aside and not look at again. Um, just coming to your paper in the Federal Law Review, um, as we discussed last time, fiduciary principles have been one of the enduring themes of your career. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the paper, you refer to a quote from Professor Leslie Zines. He's someone I've met because he used to come and always used to come and say hello to Kurt, and he was a lovely man. And I just wondered, uh, well, in an earlier paper, 1995, on which your later paper builds, he said that you were lured into a heresy on public fiduciaries, and I I wondered what he was referring to. Um, let me backtrack slightly. Leslie now, two days ago, re returned to Cambridge and he's here for four months. Oh. So uh, you will be able to have the opportunity to see him again. He is uh, a marvellous man uh, and a great scholar. We've dis Leslie and I disagree on an awful lot of things. When I said being lured into a heresy, uh, I'd said that's with tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> Le Leslie does think a lot of my views um, are not ones he would share and I think a lot of his views are not ones I would share. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when I say a lot of, that's overstating it. But 
<laughs> um, your book chapter in Exploring Private Law to celebrate the work of Professor Michael Bryan is about the general question of Australian reaction to internationalisation of laws and legal systems. And you take contract law as an example. Now, obviously, I've only managed a cursory read, but I was very interested in one of your remedies on page 65, and I quote, How we teach contract law can be a significant aspect of our solution. Well, I think that's true. Well, that very much is the case that I talked earlier about, or mentioned earlier, trying to understand the reasons for the divergence between English and Australian law. If you look at bare contract law in the two countries, you would see in a lot of areas apparent similarities. When you actually look at the context of the two bodies of law, the two countries, they're very different, and the thing that's made them very different, I think more than anything else, or well, the two things, sorry, I should be more accurate. One is the continuing development of equity in Australia and its near demise in England. And that's had significant impact on things like uh, whether a stopple can be a cause of action, whether you can have reliance liability without consideration in contracts. Well, that's the case in Australia as it is in the United States and New Zealand, but not in England. So this equity is one thing, and I could go on about length about that, but the other is statute, that while we have very few statutes that deal with contract law generally, again, as with the United States, we have very, very significant legislation which deals with unfair and misleading practices in trade and commerce. It doesn't have to be contractual, but it impacts on contract. And when you look at contract law against the background of these statutes, much of contract law loses its significance because you may not have a cause of action in contract, as in England you would not have a cause of action in contract you sure as hell have a cause of action under the, what was the Trade Practices Act. And I'm not just talking about consumer law, I'm really talking about business law. So the context really matters. And it seems to me our educators, particularly when they teach contract, teach bare contract law far more than contract law in its context. Right. And when it's taught in its context, you see a completely different scheme of regulation of business behaviour than contract law would uh, lead you to believe is the case. And that's what makes it very sharp differences when you read English cases and you'll get a party loses for some contract reason, and the very contract, uh, the very conduct in question in that case, these English cases, would unquestionably result in relief being given under our legislation. So would you say that this approach, um, the sort of conscious moulding of law in a certain direction to be a goal of university teaching, is this something that you could apply across all subjects or, or just oh. for contract? Oh, no, 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 across many subjects. Because this goes back to something I spoke about at the beginning, at, in the first interview, and that really it's saying nothing new to, stay, to say we live in an age of statutes. And common law subjects, for the most part now, can only be seen against a statutory backdrop. And to teach the, if you look at sea law is largely concerned with regulating human relations and social organization, 
then you just can't teach the common law when you're looking at particular behavioural concerns. You've got statutes there dealing with it as well, and there has to be a moulding of it. There's a very large United States literature starting with, in modern times with Roscoe Pound, beginning of the 20th century, on that, that I think I mentioned before Calabresi's book, Calabresi having been here, you know, a common law in the age of statutes. Mm. And that's really all I'm talking about. This is just one example and contract happens to be uh, the one I pick because it's the one I've got, I think, the greatest interest in. Right. So, Judge, what awaits you on your return to Australia? <laughs> I could give you a very... Uh, and our response to that, and it's an eight-day corporations law appeal, which <laughs> I'm not looking forward to, I would have to say, but that's you, yeah, that you is as it is. But I'll be return, court. returning to the court. Yes. Um, I one of the great um, advantages of this year to be is. Um, to explore what might be a life after the judiciary and I think it's convinced me that, that perhaps I can put something back into universities uh, from whence I came without necessarily becoming a mainstream teacher which I, I don't think I'm suited for anymore but I still would like to teach Very interesting Well I have greatly enjoyed your very frank and lucid expositions of aspects of Australian law and history. It's been a great and a very genuine pleasure listening to your accounts, particularly where there are certain analogues which we don't have in the UK, mm. such as native title, um, state socialism, and I know that this is of great interest to listeners, so all that remains is to thank you very much indeed for your outstanding interviews. Very grateful.